All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to get going. A couple uh, introduction stuff, and then we will get into it. Uh, I went through the uh, the registration, so I have a little bit of an idea of what some, a couple people said that they wanted to make sure that they uh, get out of tonight. And so we'll do our best to get you all that. Um, but obviously, if for some reason we don't get to it or you think of a question later, uh, please feel free to hit us up at any time, email, text, whatever. We're happy to answer. Um, so a couple, uh, let me share my screen and go through a couple things. All right, so you guys should see my website now. Is that correct? Yep, looks like, so you see website. Um, so just a couple of things on there. Uh, we have no new brochures. So if you come down to the website, uh, you can download any of the brochures that you want. Um, I can also email them to you if you need to. Uh, South Windsor Rescue Weekend, a lot of the classes are sold out, um, but we do have some room in shoring, I believe. We might be able to get some more people in the Friday lecture if you're interested. But if there's any class you're interested there, even if it is sold out, uh, please sign up so that we have you on the wait list. Um, consistently, you know, people's things come up, life comes up. So, uh, you know, if you're interested, please do that. That's going to be a great weekend as always. Uh, spring training's coming up. So if you guys are looking for any training, please uh, reach out to us sooner than later. Um, we have dates that are filling up. So we certainly want to get you in if you're interested. Uh, the So we have the new container prop almost done. Um, our main builder is on here for the maze part of it. And then uh, we'll be doing some welding on it. Uh, some safety rails. Uh, I do take safety seriously all the time and um, most of the time. And uh, so we're going to get some of this uh, all completed. So we'll be able to have a mobile maze, mobile tech rescue trailer, lifting stabilization for the paratech stuff, all that. So we're pretty excited to roll that out. Um, just so you'll see that soon. If you're interested, uh, unfortunately, I do have to postpone the rope seminar for next week. So I'm going to reschedule that. Um, so stay tuned for that. The other seminar is good to go, uh, the, without a hose line. So we'll have that going soon. Um, all right. So that's about it. Uh, I'm going to run into, uh, what we're going to do tonight now. So we are, I am not going to go through my entire battery class tonight. We just recently, uh, rolled out our, you know, our battery program and, uh, it, it went very well the other night. Um, but what I want to kind of do tonight is most importantly answer any questions that anyone has uh, and go through kind of some of the basics on that end um, and just kind of give a little bit of an idea of what's out there, what we're experiencing. Um, and when I say we, it is the fire service. Uh, it may be uh, more obvious in some places than others, um, but I think it's coming to everybody. And so that's something that I want to, uh, you know, really address tonight. So I think the best thing to do, uh, is we'll start with some videos and I am muting the videos so that we can talk a little bit as it's happening. And these are ones I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen. Um, nothing is you know brand new, um, but I think it helps to just kind of put it all in perspective of what we're kind of trying to get across tonight. Um, so let me play this. Hopefully you guys should be able to see it. Uh, I believe it's playing, so you guys should be able to see it. If not, just someone put it in the chat that you can't see it. Um, and you should still still be able to hear me as well. And so this is a pretty good, I'd take it right off of YouTube, nothing special. And it just kind of goes through all of the different, um, you know, a bunch of different batteries that are going through. And we'll throw out all the terms out there, uh, you know, tonight, but thermal runaway, propagation, things like that. And we'll get a little bit, um, you know, we'll get a little bit into the science and technology behind it, but I'm not a battery technician. That's why I said it in class the other night. You know, if, if I if I could solve these issues, if I knew how to build these batteries, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here for a seminar, uh, a free seminar at seven o'clock on a Wednesday. I love you all, but that's not what I would be doing. So, you know, a lot of the and, and kind of go off on my tangent here that when we get into something like hazmat here, we're kind of half knowledge, half experience, right? So a lot of the knowledge that I have on this comes from research, comes from classes, comes from, uh, you know, reading, uh, all that stuff. And then I have the experience side of some of this going to some of these fires uh, and teaching some of this stuff, you know, in the hazmat world. So I, what we're kind of seeing go through here, I, and please, uh, if you have any questions as I go, put it in the chat or uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you. 
But as we're playing these videos, I think what you should be able to see is whenever something happens with these batteries, and, and it could be a variety of different things, whenever something happens, it happens very quick. It happens very um, unexpected. You can't really predict when it's going to happen. Uh, I know in our flash over class, we give a lot of like, when you see this, this is probably what's going to happen. You open a door, this is what's gonna happen. You can predict a lot of what's happening. With this, you really can't do that. It happens quicker than you can react to it. And as we're stepping up in size of the uh, batteries, it's becoming more violent, more reactive, and could certainly be a, a larger hazard for us, all right? So I will go to the next video now. I had one more that I was gonna do. All right, so th there have been a couple high profile fires based on these. Um, and we'll play, I wanna use, this is not the one I wanted. Um, Stand by. All my notes. I'll come back to it. Uh, so there's been a couple high profile events obviously involving these. Um, one is the roof rope rescue that, that just recently occurred. And you know the fire itself certainly started because of e-bike batteries but also, um, you know, kept the, I'll just kind of let it play and you guys can watch. Not only did this fire start from e-bike batteries, um, but it also kept the firemen from getting in quicker because of the batteries. So as you saw in the last video, as the batteries ignite or propagate and, and the, go into runaway, it sends out basically a ball of fire. And so, all the rescues basically happened on the rope from the outside because the inside team could not get into the apartment because of how violent that fire was and how the batteries were reacting. So that, you know, that, that those are some of the hazards that we're, that we're dealing with. Um, and a lot of them are very similar to when we talk about wind impacted fires. So the wind impacted fires, um, we see where those, you know, the, the wind hits the fire and then basically exacerbates it. So rather than just being a standard room and contents fire, you have something a lot more violent. And that's very similar to what we're seeing with the batteries. So I am going to start to go through the PowerPoint a little bit. I'm going to skip um, a bunch of slides and get to some of the stuff that I want to. Um, but this is the quote that I use to start it. Uh, I like I always try to give credit where credit's due. Bob Salverson. And the guys over at Hazmat, um, the Hazmat guys, if you don't listen to them, great 20, 30 minute podcast on different Hazmat. Uh, it's free. And then there's a paid subscription if you want to go beyond that. But an excellent, um, they really, they know their shit. That's all they do. And a very good resource for any of your Hazmat stuff if you want additional training on this. So I showed you that video. So we don't need to do that. So everyone says, oh, batteries are the worst. Batteries are going to kill us, right? Well, looking through here, unless you are unless you are on a desktop computer plugged into the wall, every single one of you are a couple feet away from a lithium-ion battery right now, and you're using it. So let's not go the panic route and saying batteries are going to kill us. Batteries are the worst thing in the world. We use batteries all the time. They're not going away, and they've saved a lot more lives than they've killed. So these three posts up here are just random stuff I found on the internet. One. Um, or or experience to the top left, just a random uh, you know article about firefighters using a thermal imaging camera to find victims. What do you think was powering that thermal imaging camera? Obviously a battery, probably a lithium ion battery. Uh, on the right, we had a man pinned. Um, we had a man pinned behind there uh, in this like the car elevator. And what do you think allowed them to be freed? A battery operating cutoff saw. And then on the bottom left, and many, this is just a screenshot. Many of you guys know Danny Rinaldi from Providence. Uh, he was trapped in a mayday a few years ago. And one of the tools that was used to save his life was an hydraulic spreader. So let's not jump on the bandwagon that all batteries are bad. Let's, let's learn about them, learn the issues and go from there. So I always start off with that. These are some of the resources that we've used and I will go into a little bit later. I have the links for, uh, 
all the resources out there that I've used. And there's a lot and they don't cost anything. So if you are interested in learning more about this stuff, you don't have to come to a free seminar from me. You can go online and take many free classes available uh, on your own time. So I always start off with the fact that, you know, there's stuff we know and stuff we don't know. Um, and this class, I would assume, will be ever changing because, you know, two years ago, there was a lot of differences of what we were doing at Battery Fires than, than now. Um, there's three or four big things that I'm going to throw at you later that I think you should take back to your department. And, you know, a lot of departments that signed up for tonight said, we're not a hazmat team. We don't have a hazmat team. And there's a lot of people in the industry that say this is a hazmat incident and has to be handled by a hazmat crew. Well, I agree it is a hazmat incident and you can say it needs to be handled by a hazmat crew, but that's not realistic for the majority of the departments out there. Okay. So we need to kind of, you know, figure out how to work together. Not that we're fighting, but figure out how to work together because these incidents are going to continue happening and the hazmat resources are going to get drained if they're even available. Okay. Again, a lot of what we talk about tonight is just based on research and experience, okay? So we will do some quick definitions of voltage. We're gonna talk about voltage, how the batteries are wired, and we won't get into it too technically. And if there's an electrician or someone out there uh, and I misstep, please let me know. Um, but it's important to understand how they're building these batteries and what's causing the reaction that we're seeing. So. I use the, um, and you'll see a couple of pictures of Milwaukee battery. I use the Milwaukee battery as kind of the uh, template for what we're looking at um, when we talk about voltage, basically the pressure, and then our capacity, which is our amp hours or milliamp hours and uh, watt hours, which so watt hours is the, is the amp hours times the voltage, um, just like volts times amps is wattage in the AC world. Uh, so this is a regular M18 Milwaukee battery, nine amp hour. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of it taken apart, um, but 18 volts, nine amp hours. So if you multiply that, you get 162. So it's not rocket science here. Um, and again, we're using batteries for everything, right? Batteries are the future, whether we like it or not. Um, there's certainly going to be some setbacks, uh, but they're not going anywhere. So let's figure out where the issues are and address them from there. And we'll get into that as we go through. I'm not gonna go through that past technology, um, but so lithium ion batteries, the big selling point with them is they're rechargeable, no memory. So a lot of departments I used to go to had old, older thermal imaging cameras, nickel metal hydride or NICAD batteries. And what was the complaint with those? They have memory. So you would take them off the rig, use them for a five minute investigation, put them back on the charger and you do that all the time. And what was happening, you were losing a lot of capacity out of the battery. Okay. Nickel metal hydride also, uh, would self drain. So if you just had them sitting there, but not using them. Uh, and not in a charger, they would you would go to use them and they would be dead. Lithium ions, as we see with our cell phones, as we see with all of our electronics now, are definitely the premier battery when we talk about rechargeability, uh, power life, density, so lightweight, small for the capacity that they have. And this is, this is what we're gonna see for the future. I'm not gonna play this video. So the components, and this is where we wanna get on the same page with what we're calling everything because a lot of people call this a battery, right? And if it's a double A, it is a battery. But when we're talking about lithium ion batteries, they are made up of different cells, okay? So each cell is an individual, or each cell is an individual, in this case, a cylinder, and I'll talk about the different types of cells in a little bit, but an individual cylinder, cylindrical ba uh, battery, if you will, inside of our larger pouch, okay? This is gonna be direct current. The module is all of these batteries and how they're, or all of these cells, yeah, I do it myself, all of these cells and how they're wired together, okay? And then when you add in a battery management system, the packaging and all that stuff, then you get your actual finished pack, finished battery pack, okay? So how do they make it like this? What do they do in order to get us our required voltage and amperage? I'll come back to the types in a minute. So. Those modules that I showed you in the center, the cells are arranged and then wired in either series or parallel, okay? So when you talk about wiring in series, you're talking about going from the negative to the positive, negative to the positive, and that's going to add in the voltage. So for those of you that aren't battery technicians, as I'm not, or electricians, um, we're all firemen and we know that fire trucks 
generally have if depending on the type of pumper, if it's a two stage pumper, generally those impellers can operate in either series or parallel when they're operating in series. What are we doing? We're sending water through the first impeller and then through the second impeller. And what does that do? It gives us extra pressure. It's not adding any GPM to our output. It's just adding pressure. And that's what we're doing here. We're adding those batteries together. We're not getting any more capacity, but we're getting more pressure or in this case, voltage. And uh, I did this class for Oxford the other night and Jimmy guys has approved that analogy. So I'm, I'm good to go there. When we talk about parallel, now we're talking about adding the capacities of the batteries, okay? So the, our, our voltage is going to stay the same, but we're going to get more life or more capacity out of it, okay? So when we get to that Milwaukee battery pack, we can see very clearly that we have 15 cells, one, two, three, and then we have five rows of that. So three times five is 15. So how do they wire these in order to give us 18 volts and nine amp hours? So they take those three, cell, those three cells, wire them together in parallel. Each cell is about 3000 milliamp hours. So those three wired parallel is gonna be 9,000 milliamp hours or nine amp hours, okay? And then that's still, each cylinder is only giving us 3.7 volts. So how are we getting to the 18 volts? They then, and they don't do it with a blue line across. I'm just giving an example. They then wire those three uh, sets of cells that were wired together parallel in series, 3.7 times five is gonna give us 18 and a half volts, which is, you know, for marketing terms, 18 volts, okay? So that's how they are wiring these cells together. So when we call that Milwaukee battery a battery, that's fine, terminology is fine. But when we talk about ejection and when we talk about thermal runaway and stuff, when you get into that battery, there's really 15 individual cells in there, okay? And this is a, a, a small drill battery. When you get into scooters, when you get into e-bikes, when you get into cars, now you're talking about tens, sometimes hundreds and dozens of battery cells in there. And that's when we start to run into issues. So the cells can be made up of generally three main types. This is the cylindrical cell. This is the most common when we're talking about cheaper electronics. So e-bikes, scooters, uh, some laptops. Uh, this is what generally we're going to see the battery modules made out of are these various cells, okay? Cylindrical cells are gonna have that 3.6 volt, some might say 3.7, and then they're gonna have that milliamp hour rating there. This one's 3,500, some are 3,000. Again, it's gonna depend. That number on there, 18650, um, does indicate the size of the cell, kind of just a nice to know, not a need to know. Um, but all of these cells are gonna be identical and then it's just how they wire them together that's going to give you that capacity or that voltage. The battery cells that are pouches or considered pouches, these are generally small electronics. So your phone is almost definitely gonna be this. Laptops, I've seen some that are both. Mine was pouches, but I've seen many that are cylinders as well, um, cameras. These are those smaller type batteries, okay? And these are generally going, well, we'll talk about when we go into thermal runaway later, but um, again, these are generally, and I'm do a lot generalizing, uh, generally these are made better. They're more, they're generally in the higher end electronics. So there's more engineering in them, um, a little more, a little more uh, made in the better factories, if you will. And so I would say overall, we see less issues with the pouches than we do with the cylinders. The prismatics are the other ones. Um, these you're probably not going to run into um, much except in larger uh, places. So like uh, ESS, so energy storage systems. And we will touch on those a little bit later. Um, some vehicles use them. Tesla generally uses uh, cylinders. These are larger, heavier. So there, there's more capacity to them. There's probably gonna be a lot of them wherever they are. And it's generally gonna be more in that backup power where it doesn't need to be portable and it's just staying in one little area, okay? And I go back to this series one, just so you can see this, depending on how you arrange your cylinders, uh, uh, the cells, again, that's going to give you, these numbers are things we've heard, right? We know what a 12 volt tool is. We know what an 18 volt tool is. 
36 we've heard. And then when you start looking at like scooters or e-bikes, you start hearing 48, 52 and 70 and whatnot. So when you talk about a 52 volt e-bike or hoverboard, that's 14 cylinders wired in series just to get that 52 volts, but that's not giving you a lot of capacity. So then you need another set of 14 cylinders or 14 cells, you probably change that from cylinders to cells, another set of 14 cells in order to get more capacity out of it. And so we're talking about a lot of cells inside of these mobility devices. So after they've wired them together and they've gotten their rated voltage and amperage and whatnot and capacity, this is where things split between generally the good electronics and the bad electronics or the good mobility devices and the cheap mobility devices is going to be the battery management system. So the battery management system is basically the brains of the operation. It's going to control the flow of electricity, both in the discharge and the recharge uh, arena. And the, generally, the number one cause of battery fires is during charging. Okay, so when your batteries are charging, um, when you're discharging them, it's actually not most likely to uh, cause it when it's just sitting there. It's rare that it just bursts into flames. Um, but certainly when you're charging the batteries, that's going to be a big issue. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, just kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, so why is that? Why are why when we're charging the batteries, is that the big issue? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it can depend on the electricity it's getting. So we're putting uh, these electrons in there. If we don't have the proper charger for the device that we're using, that can be a big issue. So what happens in the city a lot, and I'll just say, you know, and this may not be something that you run into a, a lot, depending on where you are, but what happens in the city a lot is initially they're going to have, uh, you know, someone's going to buy their bike, right? So they're going to buy their, um, their e-bike for work. Second thing they're going to do, if they go from point A to point B, or if they use it for deliveries or something like that, the second thing that they're going to do is buy a second battery for it. A lot of them are not going to buy the correct battery for it. They're going to buy the cheap knockoff version. The second thing they're going to buy, or third thing you're going to buy, I don't know if I can count right, third thing they're going to buy is a second charger. Same thing. They're not going to buy the correct proper OEM charger. They may buy a, buy a knockoff version that's cheaper. And then a lot of these places have multiple e-bikes, multiple scooters. So I doubt that they're labeling them and saying, hey, this charger goes for this battery, this scooter goes for this charger, this battery goes for this scooter and whatnot. So everything's being interchanged with each other, okay? So that, that's a big issue. Um, the other thing is what's gonna happen when they um, have an issue with the battery. So, you know, me and you might say, all right, I'll bring it to a battery tech or I'll uh, buy a new battery. Well, in, in their minds, if a few cells go bad, it's cheaper for them to just buy a couple cells, look up a YouTube video. And, and if I type in YouTube right now, I'll find it no problem. Um, but look up a YouTube video and just start you know, going to work on it. And, and that's something that we see a lot. A lot of these fires, especially these high profile fires, a lot of these high profile fires were started because guys were working on their batteries. They were either um, setting up theoretically an illegal uh, e-bike repair shop in their apartment and blew something up, or they were, uh, you know, modifying it and didn't modify it properly. And so that's something that we've seen a lot. And that's been a big issue for uh, the fire department in terms of some of these fires. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now. Uh, you know, this is an example of the battery uh, management system working properly. So when you have a properly working battery management system, this is what's going to happen. And you guys should be able to see that when I go to check the battery, what's happening? You can see it flashing. What does that mean? In this case, Milwaukee is a fairly robust company. They have good battery management system, high, high quality electronics. So, oh, sorry. Thought I hit it, my bad. All right, now you got the screen. So, all right, so what happens when I go to touch on it? What, what happens? It starts blinking, right? It's not working properly. It won't work. So what is actually happening? Well, in this case, the battery management system talked to the drill. The drill talked to the battery management system. The battery said, I'm too hot to go on. I cannot operate. And so the battery basically locks itself out until it gets back below proper temperatures. 
e-bikes are not doing this, right? Uh, scooters are not doing this. So when they get too hot, well, we get into what our next issue is. Let's see if I can get there. So we get into what our next issue is, and I am sharing my screen, which is thermal runaway. So this is gonna be when we get up to that next point and we are not able anymore to cool down the batteries. So thermal runaway is a definition for each individual cell. So we're not talking about at this point, we're not talking about the whole battery or the whole module bursting into flames. Thermal runaway is something that happens with one individual cell. And what happens is the heat cannot be dissipated properly. Okay. When we get into the technology and, and I'm not really going to hit the technology too hard tonight, if you want that, well, that's my selling point to bring the class in, but you'll talk about the anode and the cathode and there's a separator in there. When you get into thermal runaway, what's happening is that separator is not working anymore. Either it's been disintegrated or short circuited or something happened to it. We'll get into what causes thermal runaway, but basically that separator is not working anymore. That separator is also flammable. So what will happen is essentially that one cell overheats, cannot cool itself and catches on fire, okay? So that's one cell though. That's not theoretically a big deal. And that's why when you see a cell phone go or a laptop go or something like that, maybe you get one little burst and it might start a fire around it from the combustibles, but it generally doesn't go on and on and on, right? If you look at the first video tonight, it was a phone on the dashboard and it was on fire, but it wasn't, as drastic as some of the later ones. The problem is once you get one cell going, then it starts propagation, okay? Propagation is basically you're losing the block, right? You show up to a fully involved row, fr uh, row frame in the center of a block and you got no water. That's basically what propagation is. What's going to happen? You can do whatever you want, but it's going to spread to all the other cells there. And so that's what you see with the e-bikes, with the scooters and things like that, when they keep lighting up and keep going, we're seeing that propagation going from one cell to the next. And it spreads faster than we can react, it spreads faster than you could cool it. And that is what is the oohs and ahs that you're seeing on this video, okay? So when we talk about entering into thermal runaway, why are we going into thermal runaway in the first place? Uh, these are some of the main reasons and we'll just kind of go through them and talk about them. So environmental, so heat, cold, or chemical. So if you have, if you're, if you're leaving your phone in the, you know, when I, when I go to the beach in the summer, um, you know, after I'm done with my 20 minutes of uh, sunscreen application, uh, you know, if I forgot about my phone and it's in the sun, it may shut off on me. And what is it doing there? The battery management system is kicking in saying, Hey, I'm too hot. I'm going to go into thermal runaway. So I'm going to shut off the phone. So I don't continue to overheat. Okay. So that would be an, an environmental ha uh, hazard. Chemical exposure, so certainly um, getting it wet, and that's probably, if I had to guess, one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of them in the city, uh, you know, going into thermal runaway is these e-bikes may not be sealed properly, the scooters may not be sealed properly, and what are they doing? They're, they're in all weather, so, you know, they're getting the salt in there in the winter, they're getting rain in there, and what that does is it just starts to eat away at the batteries, corrode them, uh, eat away at the separator, it, it may not be a great uh, cell to begin with built wise. And then it ends up going into thermal runaway and then it propagates to all the rest of the cells. And that's basically what's happening. There's not a fancy, uh, any other fancy way to put it. When you talk about uh, mechanical now, you know, drop, crush, indent, shock, vibration, impact, penetration. So any of those, you know, Google it, YouTube it. Um, there's a lot. There, there was one I saw the other day of a guy that, uh, you know, literally just took a stapler and I don't know what that is, uh, took a stapler and started, um, uh, uh, put the stapler into the um, battery and it ended up just, you know, going into thermal runaway right away. So, you know, it's something that we're seeing a lot uh, happen from that. I'm just pulling up a video that I wanted to show. Um, let's see if I can find it quick. Thought I had it. Oh, here we go. So when we talk about impact, you know, this is something, and this is kind of going to get into when we talk about vehicles, this is really, you know, vehicles are not bursting into flames every day. And, you know, people like to talk about Tesla's this, Tesla that, but I'll just pause this and talk quick. People talk about Tesla this, Tesla that. A normal operating Tesla is not just going to burst into flames. I'm only aware of one time 
that there was a fire in a Tesla and there was no good reason given for it. Every other time, to my knowledge, and again, I'm not, this, this isn't what I do all day, but to my knowledge, every other time that a Tesla's had a fire, it has been from either an impact, meaning an accident, uh, it hit something and it came up into the batteries under the you know, battery cells underneath, or it something happened that caused a fire. Uh, so we're not just seeing Teslas sit there and burst into flames. There's one you'll see. Um, I think I have it. I don't know if I'm going to show it tonight, but there's one, you know, it's in a parking garage. But if you read the backstory of it, the guy hit something earlier in the day and, you know, or hit a curb or something. I forget the exact story, but it wasn't, you know, from the bike shop days when we warranty. I was just riding along and all of a sudden it burst into flames. Usually there's something that starts it. So in this case, you're seeing it happen very quickly, but you're going to see this uh, guy hit the cop car. He did a good job. And then it burst into flames almost immediately. So now that's not a normal, that's not what we would normally expect from a uh, bicycle or an e-scooter, right? So what happened there? A cell probably went in a thermal runaway and propagated very quickly to everything else. And so that's the intensity, that's the, um, the intensity and the unpredictability of these batteries, okay? So this is a good video showing it a little bit more in real time. Uh, generally, it doesn't happen as quick as that bike one did. But you can see what's happening here as it starts to the first cell goes into thermal runaway, it starts to propagate to the other cells. I like using the word propagate because it makes me sound smart. Um, but again, it's just you, you show up at a job and the exposure is two feet away and it's built out of asphalt shingles. I mean, probably, and you don't put water on it, it's probably going to propagate to that too. So that's basically all that's happening inside of those modules is that it's just moving so quickly from cell to cell and we can't stop it. Okay. Next one. All right, this is, I'll play this one, let it show this one. What I like about this too, is it shows a little more of the ejection, um, which I'm gonna add to as well. Uh, let's see, find it. I'm going to play this one and then play one more and then uh, kind of get on to the next topic on the same topic, but the next part of it. So you can see now it's really starting to move throughout, you know, uh, and if you're crawling past this, you know, you're probably going to have to change your underwear when you're done. This is the last one I want to show. And what I'll show with this one is I really want you to see the ejection. So and I'm adding this as a slide, but we'll talk about it. One of the big hazards we see is the ejection of the cells. So yes, you have that thermal runaway, it propagates, it starts that fire, but not only that, it is ejecting the cells up to 50 feet away are the studies that we've seen. So you see the fire die down a little bit and then it hits that next one. So I'm gonna pause it there. Let's just look around. You've got a cell here. You've got a cell here. Most likely they hit that wall and came back. So that could be going a lot further. And so what does that do? By ejecting cells that are on fire, what are we do? What are we doing? Yeah, I, I know if, if the fire starts on this bike right here, am I going to be surprised when it spreads to the couch next to it or the curtain above it? Of course not. But if I pull up to a private dwelling and I come into the living room, and I have a fire in the living room. And then all of a sudden someone calls me and says, hey, I have another fire, you know, down the hallway. Well, I know there's a couple of fire marshals in here. They would call that two points of origin. And what would potentially be the thought process on that would be that it was an arson investigation. When in reality, what's happening is these cells are ejecting over 50, 60, 40 feet, something like that, and could potentially start literally a second fire in the structure on the other end. So just keep in mind of that point um, from the fire, uh, you know, attack side. What are we thinking about now? Usually we have fire in front of us and that's fine. We go and attack it. But what happens if these cells or the battery goes into the thermal runaway as we're passing it uh, or after we've passed it? Now I'm approaching a fire in front of me and I have fire 
uh, you know, start up behind me. That's something we talked about in the arson days of like diesel bombs and stuff like that. And now it may not be malicious, but that's what's happening to us inside of fires. So I'll, I'll keep playing it and you'll see a, a couple more ejection cells. Uh, you'll see one hit this wall, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Towards the end, you'll see one really hit this wall. But you can see there's no rhyme or reason when this starts to eject the cells, when it uh, bursts into flames, when it dies down. And so they're very unpredictable, and that's one of the big hazards. You just saw that there. You can't say, hey, this fire died down. Let me bring this outside right now. So uh, just very unpredictable on that, and that's something that is definitely a big hazard when we're talking about uh, these battery fires. All right, so uh, I'm gonna play this video. What I like about this, this is, again, thermal runaway to propagation. These cells do not eject because as you can see, they are nailed down. Um, but what I want you to see with the thermal imaging camera, we're gonna talk about this a little bit, is there's no indication from the thermal imager that the cell is gonna go into thermal runaway, right? This one we see is already hot, but, you'll see that the next one goes into thermal runaway almost instantly. So if you look at the top, there's no heat coming from it. And then all of a sudden, boom. So when we talk about doing our secondary searches and assessing cells that we may see ejected throughout the structure, the thermal imager is not going to be an effective tool for us to decide, is this cell safe to leave here or not? So how many cells, again, generalizing, but you know, in the tool, in the uh, cell phone, usually one iPad, I think might have two, uh, laptop, usually four, six, something like that. Power tools, three to 15, scooters, 15 to 20, e-bikes, you get into the 40 to 60, but now you're talking about spare, spare batteries on it as well. And then the EVs, you know, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, a lot of them. All right. So this is really the meat and potatoes for tonight, right? I went maybe a little long on the technology than I wanted to, but what are we going to do at fires? Okay. So we have to remember that these fires can either be started from the electronic device, from the scooter, from the e-bike, or they can spread to that. So if I'm overloading, a, a you know, charging a dozen batteries, I may start a regular old electrical fire, but what happens is that it spreads to the batteries and I have a battery fire. And then obviously I could start with the battery fire and it spreads to my normal combustibles. In some ways, um, I would say that starting with normal combustibles and spreading to the batteries are probably more dangerous for us because we don't know when those batteries are going to give way. Again, I could be crawling into a hallway from a regular room and contents fire as those batteries in the hallway are giving way and all of a sudden I have fire all around me, okay? And when we talk about these devices, particularly in cities, um, yeah, private dwelling area, we're going to store them in our garage for the most part. So it's just going to be like a car fire in an attached garage. But what is it going to be like in a city when you have an apartment and you don't have anywhere to store them? Most people are going to store them. They're not going to take the time to bring it all the way in the back bedroom. Most of the time we see these scooters or these e-bikes stored right in the path of entry and exit. And that was the roof rope rescues were, were uh, performed because all of these bikes were stored right in that path of entry and egress. So until water was put on the fire, there was no entering that apartment. Um, so I just mentioned that here. Uh, and again, these cell phones, some people sleep with them under their pillow. You ever taken them out in the morning? They're hot. So, you know, you want them to be away from, you know, your, your point of access, egress. Uh, cell phones should be on the side table, not under your pillow, um, all that stuff. You know, so this video, I'm going to play it once. Normally I play it twice in the class. You're going to see it for what it is, but I also want you, want you to think about being a fireman coming in. So if this uh, scooter happens to not be, you know, going into thermal runaway until you pass it, what happens if you're stretching the line or not even stretching the line, coming in this living room to do a search, zero visibility. So you're not going to see that scooter next to you. What happens if right as you pass it, it goes into thermal runaway and propagation. So you're going to see this kid as he runs past it. That could be a fireman doing a search. And at that instant, in zero visibility, all of a sudden fires all around you. I think at this point, most of us at, for, you know, in our minds would think that the room just flashed over on us. But we have to realize this is some of the hazards that we're seeing out there. Now, is a cell phone going to be as dramatic as that? Absolutely not. One cell. But as these hoverboards and I look through you know, my house and what's here, um, there's plenty of lithium ion stuff. 
And again, it's, it's generally the cheaper side of things, how things are constructed, mischarging them. Maybe they were thermally abused or physically abused, dropped earlier in the day, and now they're, they happen to go into thermal runaway at this point. And from the fire department investigative standpoint, that's the problem is we don't know when it is, right? So we can look at an outlet and say, hey, it's hotter. You know, maybe you burnt out uh, wiring or this ballast is burnt out on a light. You can't look at these batteries with a camera, with a voltage meter or anything like that and say, hey, this battery is, is going to go into thermal runaway at, at a future point. All right, so again, the batteries spread to the combustibles or the combustibles spread to the batteries. Either way, it's a dangerous situation. It's going to ignite things very quickly um, and we need to be ready for that. I mentioned the arson part. And again, fire spreading to the batteries. I kind of went over this, so I'm not going to do it too. I'm not really going to get into it too much. Um, but you can have a regular combustible, a regular fire from an ordinary cause, and then it spreads to the batteries, and it's going to give us the same reaction as if it started with the batteries. So, in the end, what's our basic operations? Put water on the fire. Do not overthink this. I mentioned that that separator is a flammable is, is theoretically a flammable liquid. It is so minute of a liquid. We are not worrying about foam, dry chem, anything like that. Water is king, okay? Do not overthink this. You don't need foam, you don't need dry chem, you don't need any of that stuff. Water has worked for every battery fire that of this kind that we've gone to, okay? Um, there is no, there has not been any evidence of electrical uh, uh, shock hazard to personnel. Use water, okay? Use your SCBA throughout. I will talk about the hazmat side of it in a little bit. Be ready for the unexpected. I think the videos prove that. At no point could we replay these videos and you could point, oh, that happened, so that's going to happen. You just can't. Once it goes into thermal runaway and propagation, it's quick and unexpected. I kind of you know, compare it to a gas tank letting go during a fire, right? a car fire. You just don't know when it's gonna happen and if it happens, it's very obvious. Again, the constant flare-ups. We had a job a, a couple of years ago, kind of before a lot of this stuff was becoming commonplace. And, um, you know, as we were making the push in the basement, it kept, it wasn't dramatic, but it kept flaring up on us. And, uh, you know, almost looked like a gas fed fire in a, in a way. And, and this is what it was. We ended up finding a lot of batteries that were being stored on the stairs of this commercial occupancy. And so they were probably going into thermal runaway as uh you know as we were making the push down it was you know well, it wasn't super hot but it was warm enough that the battery cells were starting to fail and go into thermal runaway so this is another one the, the cells that eject may not have failed yet right it may just have been the pressure of the surrounding cells so you may find intact cells throughout the structure or they could have gone into thermal runaway and ejected but if they did not go into thermal runaway yet, if they are still intact, that's a ticking time bomb. Those could ignite at any point, so they need to be taken care of. And yes, we will talk about what taking care of them means in a little bit, okay? Um, again, all the cells, all the modules, all the batteries. I use the term cells, but if the cells are all together in a module or a battery pack and it's in the fire area or near the fire area, or smoke stained, or shows any sign of melting, to me, those are all ticking time bombs that need to be taken care of. We are not leaving the structure with those there. All right, and I, re I repeat the things that are important. All right, so ba battery operations after the fire. Now, when I say after the fire, I'm not saying we're back at the firehouse. I'm saying we're done with our main focus of, of knocking down the heavy body of fire, okay? So we still have overhaul. We still may be finishing our primary search. We still need to do a secondary search, but we've knocked down the main body of fire. We may still have hidden fire and it could break out at any point, but that's where I'm defining this area, right? I'm not worried if I'm crawling through a structure performing a primary search. I'm not worried if I see a battery cell and throwing it out the window. That, that's not what I'm doing. This is later. This is theoretically for, you know, this, this is theoretically during the overhaul stage, okay? So we have to remove all cells. And I got a comment on this. I will change this to cells, batteries, modules. So there's no, you know, someone said, well, if, if 
the module is in one piece. Can I leave that? No, we are removing all cells, all batteries and all modules from the fire area. I will let you define what the fire area is. If the fire was on the first floor and there's nothing but some smoke damage on the second floor, I, you know, and, and it didn't get hot up there. I'm not sure that those batteries need to be removed. But certainly if there was a fire in the kitchen and you find a laptop in the kitchen or an M18 battery in the kitchen, that needs to be removed from the structure. It either went into thermal runaway or it could go into thermal runaway. And again, scanning it with a thermal imaging camera, not effective to say if this battery is safe to leave or not. I'm not taking that chance and neither should you, okay? So all cells, all batteries, all modules from the fire area must be removed. SCBA must be worn throughout this. I, I think we're, we know why on the overhaul side, but look at how quick these batteries went into thermal runaway, okay? You are not going to be able to mask up in the time that it takes the battery to go into thermal runaway, okay? So wear your SCBA if you are handling batteries in any form. So a couple, uh, I looked at the question, I looked at the, um, the questions. There was one stupid one, but uh, you know, the rest were, were pretty good. You know who you are. Uh, cells, it, it did make me laugh though. Cells should be placed in a bucket and removed from the structure. Uh, I would not, if I didn't have to pick up uh, a cell by hand, again, there's no, there, there's no true, um, that I've seen data saying that you're, you're in risk of an electrical shock, but certainly uh, you do not want to have that go into thermal runaway in your hand. I think there's a very good chance that you would end up with some sort of burns, even if you're wearing proper gloves or anything. So, you know, I would use a shovel, uh, I would use a bucket, um, you know, any of that stuff. I would try to be as gentle as possible, especially if the cell did not go into thermal runaway yet. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, you can put a bucket on the side and kick the cells in, but that's not gentle. Now you're literally putting abuse onto the cell. It doesn't have any protection. So, you know, I would be as gentle as possible. I wouldn't go crazy, um, but get the cells, get the modules, get the batteries into a bucket. It can be any bucket at this point. We're not overpacking it. We just want to get it outside of the structure. Think if it's a plastic Home Depot bucket, that's absolutely fine in my opinion. Treat, this is almost like a chimney fire, right? We're just we're trying to get the ashes outside. Now these aren't actively burning, so you know if they're just regular cells and they're not burning, um, it shouldn't melt the plastic bucket, and we're not leaving it in the plastic bucket and taking up. Uh, so get it in a bucket of some sort and get it out of the house. But guess what? If you guys have a chimney bucket, chimney fire bucket, then that's probably the best thing to use. Uh, don't use your thermal imager. That's not going to tell us. Don't pick up by hand. Use a shovel. So what's going to happen? Um, you know, we get there, we get the fire knocked down. There's a lot of stuff around, right? So we have to decide how we're going to, and we do this, you know, where, 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 and I've, uh, when I've experienced, you know, a fire that needed to be investigated, we play this it, game is the wrong term, but we play this balancing act with the fire marshals every day, right? Can I overhaul this or do you want to get some pictures first? Do I need to, can I put some water on this and wash it down? Or do you need to, you know, get some pictures and take a look at it first? So now we're just playing that balancing act between overhaul and searching for cells. Because if these cells were ejected and I will use this, I will use this moment to go on my, um, my recent, tan not tangent, but estimation. Uh, yeah, I'm a buff. I, I see all the fires that go on and, and whatnot. It seems to me, and I'm not keeping track, maybe I should, it would lead more credence to this uh, theory. It seems to me that there have been more um, rekindled lately. And I don't think the fire department's all of a sudden gotten bad at overhaul. Uh, maybe some have, but for the most part, um, I don't think much has changed on that end. I have a sneaking suspicion that at least some rekindles that we're seeing could potentially be this where it wasn't a battery involved fire, but the battery was close enough to the fire. The cells were close enough to the fire. They were not removed from the structure. And then they went into thermal runaway hours and sometimes even up to a day later. And that's what's causing the rekindle, not the fact that the fire department messed up and didn't put the fire out or didn't perform proper overhaul. My guess is none of you, because um, at least until recently, even we weren't really doing it, uh, removing the cells that were in the uh, affected area. So, you know, that's something that I think is really important to keep in mind. 
is if you were leaving these cells behind or you're leaving these batteries behind and they were in the affected fire area, um, I just think that's a recipe for disaster for the most part. So get those cells out of there, get the batteries modules out of there, uh, play it safer than sorry. And um, you know, then we'll find out if you're good at, at uh, overhaul or not. And if the rekindles are fire department's faults. So again, searching for cells, um, if we overhaul real quick, uh, we're gonna cover up all these. But if we don't overhaul and we just look for cells, what's gonna happen? Well, the fire, if it's in the wall is gonna burn away on us. So I'm not gonna tell you how to operate or you know, find, but you gotta find that balancing act. Um, and again, I don't, I think it's later that we're looking for the cells and stuff. I think that's more on the secondary search side when we're doing that painstakingly thorough search. Uh, that's when if I see any batteries and it was, they're charred or they're in the fire area and could have been, um, you know, uh, they were susceptible to high heat or impact or anything, get them out of there. I don't think that's worth taking a chance on. All right. So once we get them out, what are we doing then? Um, this, yeah. So again, treat, treat them, once you get them outside of the structure, treat them like remnants from a chimney fire, right? We wouldn't remove stuff from the chimney that's you know burning and dump it right in front of the front door, or dump it on something combustible, right? So, you know, if you don't have, and we'll talk about the overpacking, but if you don't have that ability, at least get them away from anything. So if they burn, they're not going to burn everything around it. But really, we would like to contain them so that if they do burn or they do start to eject, they're not going to eject right back into the structure. Okay. Uh, I kind of mentioned that, so I'm not going to go through that. So bathtub's another option. So if we're not, if, if we don't have the ability to remove them from the structure right away, whether it be manpower, whether it be um, just logistics or whatever the case may be, for us, a big thing would obviously be we're on the, you know, 20th story. So we're not just bringing each battery down individually. We may not have the stuff up there with us. Uh, a bathtub is a good option uh, to put, you know, kind of put all the cells in. I guess a sink would be too. Um, but a bathtub just kind of puts it out of the way a little bit more. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the hazards of that as well. It's not the end all be all, um, but it's an option to put it in there until you get the items, the buckets or whatever in order to uh, properly overpack them. But these are the four, my four big takeaways for you. Use water, use SCBA, don't rely on your camera and remove all cells. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot more about using your SCBA, not how to do it obviously, but why we're going to and what the hazards are from the hazmat side of this, okay? So if you're doing that high rise thing, how are you transporting it down to the ground, right? Um, elevator? Well, listen, the, there's reality and theoretical, right? Uh, I, I think the reality is if we're on the 40th floor and I know many that, that, that may not be an issue, but even if you're on an upper floor, you're not just simply uh, walking it down the stairs necessarily. So the elevator might be an option. However, if you're going to use an elevator, there should not be any human personnel in that elevator, right? I think that's a big takeaway is uh, don't put people in that elevator if you're going to use the elevator. Just realize the hazard that you're putting in there, okay? Someone asked, uh, yeah, so at the tub, you can fill it with water. You don't have to fill it with water. Uh, you can use a bucket in there. It doesn't matter. Um, some will, will fill it with water, uh, you know, and then if it goes in the thermal runaway or whatever, it'll extinguish it. The downside is just it, it's messy and it makes for a pain in the butt to get everything out of there. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on from the off gassing of these, um, but you can definitely put water in the tub if you want. All right, so this becomes the next question. What do we do with it once we get out of the structure? Um, you know, and this is not something I can really give you an answer on because this is going to be, I'm pulling up an email with some information I have. This is going to be dependent on your, uh, on your, uh, uh, you know, lo lo local uh, assets, if you will. So is sanitation going to get it? Is an environmental company going to get it? Stuff like that. That's something you have to figure out beforehand. Uh, if you're on this meeting tonight, I think you're interested enough in the topic and you realize that this is an issue at some point that you will face that you should probably make a call at some point and figure out, hey, what are we doing? And again, we're not talking about when the e-bike store goes on fire, that, that's its own you know, thing, or the Tesla goes on fire, that's its own thing. We're talking about one five gallon bucket worth of cells, right? What are we doing with them after? And that's gonna be up to you guys to figure out. So, um, but we're gonna get it into that bucket. Once we get it outside, we're gonna get it 
what we do is a metal bucket, usually 55 gallon drum or smaller. Uh, if it's a 55 gallon drum, I'm in charge. Uh, and we're gonna get it into that drum, fill it with water or cell block, which we'll talk about later, and then cut and then put a lid on it, cover it and label it. If you are putting a lid on it, you have to make sure that there's a vent hole. So in a 55 gallon drum, you get two bung holes, remove them. Uh, because if this does go into thermal runaway, Underwater, it will off gas and what does off gassing do it, it will build pressure in there so make sure that it has a way to get out still okay. So do not think that submerging the batteries is going to take care of everything, it will keep it from igniting, but it will still off gas through the water so make sure that we are not sealing these barrels 100% tight. Um, we did reach out because we had this question the other night. Uh, what about DEP are we calling them or whatnot so uh, this is. This is the email from DEP. Uh, they want to be in, in this for if you're out of uh, the Connecticut area, this is Connecticut DEP. So they want to be notified of any type of lithium ion battery involvement. They will likely not respond for small cells or packs. The FD should overpack or make safe uh, larger scale incidents or larger packs and modules. They will respond. Currently, they are referring people to Environmental Services Incorporated a company out of South Windsor for cleanup and removal. So that's what we got from them. Um, but certainly I would encourage you to contact your local DEP rep if you have any questions on that. Don't use me as the uh, end all be all. So are there any questions so far on operations? We're gonna nerd out a little bit on the hazmat stuff, um, but that's really the operation level. And hopefully what you took away, even though we talked for an hour about it, is. Pretty damn simple, right? Use a lot of water, scoop them up in a shovel, put them in a bucket, make sure they're all out of the house. That, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, they're, they're putting off a lot of nasty stuff and we'll talk about that now, but the actual operation of it is, is pretty simple, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I hope that that helped and shed some light, shedded some light on uh, some questions you guys have. But that's about what I'm going to talk about on the operation side. So if you have any questions, if I didn't touch on something, please put it in the chat so I can address it. So I've become a hazmat nerd, apparently, um, and I never thought I'd be do, you know, talking about meters and hazmat stuff so much. But I said wear your SCBA, so let me just prove it to you, okay? These are the gases that come out of a battery that's going to thermal runaway. You guys saw the videos of the smoke and everything. So these are the gases coming out of there. Hydrogen, very flammable. Hydrogen fluoride, very toxic. Carbon dioxide, inert. So just going to displace the oxygen. Dimethyl carbonate, flammable. Uh, ethane, flammable. Ethylene, flammable. Methane, flammable, okay? Um, and there could be more, all right? So someone texted me, even though I said to put a question in the chat, but I, I will answer it anyway. Um, and I think this is where you kind of split again from the book to reality. And so, and it's a very good question and you're lucky I have my phone on me. So in regards to DEP and overpacking, uh, is that covered under hazmat ops or is it a tech skill? I would say that it's a tech skill because it's mitigating, but again, we don't, I just think the reality is we don't have the capability to always call a tech, right? Um, and there's a there's a big discussion. There have been big discussions that technically shutting the gas off to a stove. You have an odor of gas. You get in there, you meter. You have a leaking, you know, propane gas stove or natural gas stove. That shutting off that valve is technically a technician level skill. You know, I, that sounds ridiculous, but when you look at what the definition of operations versus technician is. Technician is mitigating the incident. That is mitigating the leak or mitigating the incident. So I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I don't know the standard off the top of my head. I, I'll probably go read it because it is a good question. Um, I would say it's probably a technician level skill. Certainly in the city, we treat it as a technician level skill, um, but we uh, for the final overpacking, but the removal from the structure, anyone could do. So. I don't really have a good, true legal answer for you. Um, what I would say is risk versus reward. We're going to be on air. We're going to do it properly. But I think you got to get the cells out of there and you got to get them, especially if they haven't gone to thermal runaway. I think you got to get them out of there so that they don't go into thermal runaway. If I'm there waiting for a hazmat team for two hours, 
and then they ignite and now I have to fight another fire because I've been waiting and didn't remove them. I think that's equally on the um, irresponsible scale. So my opinion, not fact, uh, so take it for what it is. So the gas is very flammable and one of them is very toxic. Hydrogen fluoride is what I'm gonna point out as the really toxic one, okay? Uh, this, so this is a picture, I'll go back to that. This is a picture of batteries going into thermal runaway underwater. You can plainly see that they are still off gassing. So when we talk about putting batteries in a bathtub in a bathroom, we have to realize that if we fill it with water, that's still not the end all be all. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So hydrogen fluoride, toxic irritant, corrosive gas, reactive with water. Um, now reactive with water, but we are using copious amounts of water. So we're not too concerned on that level of the reactivity. However, if inhaled, now we are talking about reactive with water inside of our lungs. That's what's gonna give us that pulmonary edema. That's going to kill you or at least put you in the hospital for a long time. So that is our main, this is kind of the big one on why we're using our SCBA. 30 parts per million IDLH. IDLH immediately dangerous to life or health. So CO is 1200 parts per million IDLH. So this is a lot more toxic than CO. And I just use CO as kind of like that, that one we, we deal with and know all the time, right? Your meters probably alarm at 35 parts per million of CO. And in reality, that's what you can, I think that's the TWA time weighted average. So you can, you can work for eight hours in 35 parts per million of CO. 30 parts per million of hydrogen fluoride is gonna kill you. And I think theoretically it's 15 minutes. So very, very deadly stuff. Why did I put the EV or the ionization potential in there? Well, if you guys have a PID meter, uh, can you meter for hydrogen fluoride? And the answer is no, because most of our PID meters are going to be that 10.6 bulb. So it's only going to read something with the ionization potential of less than 10.6. So that's always good to know when you look it up. If you don't have a PID, don't really need to know that. But if you do have a PID, good to know that we're probably that we're not going to be able to meter for hydrogen fluoride. Okay. I'm going to go back to that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more. And I'm adding this to the presentation because I think, again, on the non-hazmat technician side, we want to understand what our meters can do and can't do. So th that off-gassing, are our meters going to pick up that off-gassing or what are they going to pick up from it? What is it going to show? Okay. So anything flammable with a catalytic bead sensor, which is mostly what, of, what our LEL sensor is, um, our meters will pick it up to some level. Okay. So methane is obviously usually what they're calibrated to, but the others, it could definitely pick up as well. So just realize it's not going to be accurate. So you should be using, if you are using your LEL meter, and I'll give you a reason why we wouldn't necessarily use meters in a minute, but if you are bringing your four gas meter to meter around batteries, it is not going to be accurate. It will tell you if it's measuring flammable gas in the air or not, but it is not going to be accurate to tell you how much for a few reasons. Number one, it's not calibrated to anything but methane, but also we're getting a mix of gases here, right? So it's not just reading one single gas, it's reading a mix of gases. So the bottom line is it may show you LEL and that should just be an indication that we have, um, you know, uh, a flammable gas in the air but not an, not an indication of how much we have in the air, okay? Hydrogen is the other one on here that's really gonna uh, make our heads spin, okay? In my meter class, um, I go through an incident where we had hydrogen and it set off every single thing on the meter. So hydrogen is a very um, interesting gas when you talk about metering because it will set off probably every single sensor that you have. It will set off your LEL because as we know, it's a flammable gas. And so it will at some point, uh, if there's enough hydrogen, it will read that there's a flammable gas in the air and you will see the LEL move. It will also set off your CO, H2, S, and O2 most likely because of, and I'm not gonna get into the science and technology behind it, but because of how the hydrogen atoms basically attack the electro electrochemical sensor, hydrogen is very, very cross sensitive for those other three gases. So most likely if you have a battery that is off gassing, all four gases on your uh, meter are going to show that they're going off. 
And if that's what you're seeing, there's a good chance that that's hydrogen. Now you can get a hydrogen specific single gas meter out there. You can get a hydrogen fluoride specific single gas meter out there. I believe uh, uh, Boston is actually looking at those, um, but neither of them are cheap and they neither of them have a long shelf life to them. So it's not, it's not a super, I don't think it's something that we're seeing in the fire department anytime soon, okay? So the bottom line is where are SCBA? Going back to the bathtub, that's gonna be one of the hazards of keeping the batteries in the bathtub. Generally bathrooms are small. If we keep that door closed and the window closed, now we're allowing those gases to build up in that small room. So I would certainly say probably stay away from filling up a bathtub with these if it doesn't have a window. And if there is a window, probably make sure that you open it up. And then again, the other thing that these gases do, particularly hydrogen to our meters, is destroy sensors. So if you use, um, if you use Drager meters, please put them right on the batteries because I'm ready to sell you more sensors. But in all seriousness, uh, probably keep your meters a distance away from these so that you don't destroy the sensors on them, okay? Not good for them. So that, that's the hazmat side. If there's any questions, uh, again, throw it up there. What I am going to do now is kind of skip ahead a little bit and go to, I wanna go through the resources and then wrap up tonight. So when we talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk about ESS real quick. I'm really not gonna talk about EVs and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you why. But the ESS energy storage systems, um, there's a lot to them. This is the Surprise Arizona one. Uh, and we use this as a case study in our class. But essentially, you know, I, I didn't really read about it much. It was out there. I just never really read it much. And then really, um, and I'll show you where I got a lot of the information from it. I always thought it was like they showed up and it blew up. And in reality, the explosion was about two hours after arrival. So a company got it as a smoke in the area. They found some smoke coming from the ESS container uh, or they recognized it to be a hazmat incident. The guys that actually got blown up were the hazmat team. It wasn't just untrained firemen that went in there. It was the hazmat team. Um, again, they found high concentrations of everything in there uh, or around there. There was a, a, a cloud coming out. They had, you know, LEL, CO, H2S, and they were not specifically getting those but most likely they were picking up hydrogen. And because hydrogen is uh, very explosive as well, I mean, you basically had a stationary Hindenburg there, okay? Um, so if you have an ESS, if you have an energy storage system like this, a lot of times they're made out of 20 foot or 40 foot connex boxes. Uh, just make sure you're finding out that, you know, make sure you're finding out if they're in your area so that you can address them properly, okay? So when we talk about uh, different, I will talk about the hand and bus fire as a matter of fact. So in this, and I'll talk about this because um, if, if you haven't heard about this, but you probably did, they had a bus fire, electric bus fire. But the reason why this wasn't even worse, and this kind of goes into, we don't know yet. Um, they went there at 3 a.m. or so, uh, the bus was in the shop. They went in there about 3 a.m. The bus was inside, not actively smoking upon the arrival, um, but it was reported to them that it had been previously smoking. So it wasn't to the point that the fire department needed to take action on it. You know, we're not preemptively putting water onto uh, something that's not smoking if someone said it was smoking, right? Think about going to someone's house and they said, my outlet was smoking. We don't, and then we get there and there's no smoke. We're not just taking an inch and three quarter and washing down their wall, right? Maybe we'll put a small hole in there to check for extension, pop the breaker, things like that. In this case, it wasn't to the point that the FD needed to act. But what they did do was remove the bus from the facility and park it away from everything else. And then as I say, the rest is history. So they come back a few hours later and the bus is fairly well involved. I don't know, I don't think this is an arrival picture, but the bus is well involved. So. We're, yes, this is a city bus, but where do we translate this into the residential side? You know, um, we go to a, a house and someone says, you know, my Tesla was smoking a few minutes ago and now we get there and it's not smoking. Well, we're not going to dump an inch three quarter on it, but what do we probably want to do? We probably want to say, listen, obviously there's an issue. Um, we don't know what it is. We're not car techs. 
But the safest thing to do at this point would be to put it outside for the night so that if it goes into thermal runaway and ends up igniting on fire, you're not burning your entire house down. And so that's something that I certainly see us going to for a couple of reasons, uh, not the least of which is going to be that as more of these types of incidents are in the are seen in the um, sorry, as these incidents are seen in the news, people are going to start having the worry, you know, the worry, worried well syndrome of, oh, I thought my battery was overheating. So let me call the fire department, you know, so I think we're going to see that more and we need to be ready with a good answer. Um, of what we're going to do for that. So I'm gonna go through a couple of quick products. I know I keep saying I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up, but I do wanna go through the products. And uh, none of these I endorse, none of these I sell, um, but people always ask what's out there. And then I will answer a question that I haven't gotten to, and then um, I will wrap it up. So these are some of the products available. Cell Block is the only one of these that I've actively used. Um, and, and this really came actually from the airline industry when the uh, phones, because I don't believe that when it says Cell Block, I'm pretty sure that they're talking about cell phones and not like individual cells. And where this came from was when the uh, Samsung, I think it was, had the issues and the phones were basically, there were a couple of phones that were going to throw a runaway in flight. Um, they said, hey, we don't really have water up here. How are we putting these fires out? So this was the product that was developed uh, for air, air, air lines to carry so that they could basically overpack these phones in the air without having to use water, okay? Fire departments adopted it. Uh, so it's a good way to overpack uh, uh, cells, modules, batteries. Um, and again, this is kind of where it comes uh, from your question uh, before about, is this a tech skill? Um, as easy as it is to remove batteries, put them in a bucket, you know, you can't fill it to the brim and then expect it to absorb everything, right? So there is a rated amount of cell block used for a rated amount of batteries. So you know, because and we've learned the hard way that, you know, we put in too many batteries for not enough cell block. OK, this stuff's not 100 percent. I have seen batteries go into thermal runaway and reignite in the cell block, but it does work very well. It's a lot lighter than water. Um, so this is an option for your overpacking. The EV blanket, I'm fairly skeptical on. Um, and I've had some good discussions with people that have seen them. However, everyone that's seen them, to my knowledge, locally, have only been used on the regular com internal combustion engines, right? Um, one thing we didn't really talk about is these batteries, they produce their own oxygen. They don't require oxygen. So as they're going to thermal runaway and propagation, they're actually producing their own oxygen. So the only thing the EV blanket theoretically then can do is keep that fire from spreading. It's not truly smothering the fire like what we think a blanket would do. The other factor is just, is this realistic, right? Um, you know, if the car's in the middle of nowhere, maybe, but if we're in a tight parking garage or, or someone's, you know, residential garage, I'm not really sure I want my fireman walking right up next to this vehicle to throw a blanket on it. Even if it does work, what's the realistic nature of being able to use this? I don't have the answer, so I'm not sitting here telling you not to use it or not to look into it. I'm just saying these are some of the skeptical items that I've heard. And people say, well, what about an underground parking garage? Because that's my biggest concern is a Tesla going, you know, in an underground parking garage. Well, it's probably going to be zero visibility or close to it. So even if this works and even if we have the room to use it, uh, I just think that's going to be a pretty uh, tough sell to get this in place properly. So. Um, I'm happy to look at it uh, and you guys, you know, if you're interested, look at it, but I just don't know if it's going to be usable. This is pretty cool. I just started to see the emergency plug um, and this basically gets plugged into the uh, charging port on the vehicle. Um, there's no high voltage part of it. It's just the low voltage side. And what it does is basically trick the vehicle into thinking that it's in the charging station. And what that does is kind of shut it off. If you will, it can't move. That's going to be our big hazard with these vehicles is they could move at any moment and they're silent. So, you know, the key fob, getting that away, chalking the wheels, um, those are some big stuff that we have to do. But again, that, you know, that's beyond what we're looking to talk about tonight. But this is gonna get in there, trick the vehicle into thinking it's in a charging port and basically allow it not to move. And what I was really, um, uh, what I thought was cool was that um, the future software says that it'll be able to uh, possibly tell if the batteries or the cells are going into thermal runaway. I don't know if this is gonna be used in a fire, but certainly in a car accident, this might be a cool option. Uh, piercing nozzle, making a comeback. So um, I have no idea, right? I mean, 
in reality, we have to get water onto the cells. Just putting it underneath is not going to be good enough. It really needs to penetrate onto the cells. Um, I heard Tesla's new design was going to be an aluminum pan. So if it burns, it can melt away or whatever. And then you'll have access to the cells. I, I, I don't know, right? You, you could take this for what it's worth. It's supposed to do eight gallons a minute, uh, suppress a vehicle fire in 500 gallons. Um, it's air activated piercing nozzle and it operates basically like a floor jack. I have not seen it in operation. I have no idea if it works, um, but it's something I've seen out there that at least I wanted to you know, put on here for you to see. So someone did mention in the questions, so what do I do if I get it? You know, I don't have a hazmat team coming. What do I do if a Tesla lights on fire? And um, Listen, that's, there's no silver bullet. That is, that is the question, right? No one really has a good answer for it. Um, some people are adamant that they're going to let it burn. Listen, if it's in the middle of nowhere, I don't really care if you let it burn, but uh, I think you got to have a plan if it's not in the middle of nowhere, right? If it's up against a person's house, if it's in someone's garage, if it's in a parking garage, at that point, I don't really think you have the ability to just say, I'm just going to let it burn. So, um, I, you know, I don't have the silver bullet. If I did, uh, I wouldn't be giving this class for free. Uh, I'd be charging you because I would have the silver bullet and no one else would, and there is none. I will say that the water seems to knock it down pretty well. And then you just have to worry about the flare ups. You know, certainly at some point you got to get it out of, if it's in a co compromised location, you got to remove it and it has to be placed away from everything else. We've seen these Teslas, um, you know, go up in flames hours and days later. So, you know, overseas, they're putting them in 30, uh, 30 yard dumpsters filled with water. Um, I don't really see that coming to fruition here, but I could be wrong. And, and again, if you're, um, if your, uh, if your hazard is not there, then, you know, if you put water on a car fire in the middle of nowhere and you have to use up to 10,000 gallons, which is what some of them are saying out there, well, where's that water runoff going to go? You know, so that's going to be a big, uh, a big issue. Uh, someone asked about the Linfield Mass one. You know, I saw the headlines. I've been at work a couple of days, so I don't really know much about it. I do have some friends up in Linfield, so I'll uh, maybe reach out to them and see if they can give me anything. 90,000 gallons is a lot of water. Uh, I don't know if that's, that that's a lot of water. Um, but just consider if it's in the middle of nowhere, yeah, we have a environmental issue, but then if we start putting water on it and it's running into the storm drain, now we have another issue. What I will say is there is zero evidence that a foam agent is going to work. Okay. Um, both because this isn't a flammable liquid fire. That's what foam is for class B specifically. And then again, smothering it doesn't help if it's creating its own, um, if, if it's creating its own oxygen. So uh, someone said we placed J hooks with 25 foot chain to pull it away from the exposure. So that that's absolutely, I, I think that's gonna be a key is getting it away from the exposure. Maybe if it's in a garage, you knock it down quickly and then get a winch on it, pull it out, something like that. Um, or, or J hooks, whatever chain you can, but yeah, get it out of that structure. I don't think we want it remaining in that garage. If it's a residential structure. I don't think we want this battery car remaining in that garage. And if for some reason we cannot remove it for whatever reason, we're not leaving that scene. We're going to need someone with a charged hose line the entire time while it's there. Okay. Um, and I, I didn't mention it before because it was a fire, but if we're removing cells from a structure, maybe it's not a fire, uh, we should have a charged hose line with us. Okay. And I know I'm, again, probably skipping some things I shouldn't, but I'm trying to keep this to, you know, an hour and a half or so. So these are the four resources I'm going to go through with you guys and just kind of show you how it works. Um, here we go. I have another question. I will address it in a minute. So, I mean, anyone can access this, but for the CT guys, this came out of the CT Fire Academy, the CF, whatever. Uh, there's basically a task force that worked on these. I'm not involved in that, but there's some good information here if you want to, uh, you know, look uh, look through this. I, I would say it's not as operational as it is just basic guidance, um, but it should give you a good starting point if you're looking to get some information out there. I'm not going to sit here and read it through it with you. You can do that. Um, what I will do, 
is after I show you all these links, I'll put them in the chat so you can uh, access them. NFPA for all that, for all of their faults um, does have a good emergency response guide. So if you come here, you can pick whatever vehicle you're looking at, uh, you know, and go and, and to those individual vehicles, get a PDF and it'll go through everything. Some of it as this one is maybe a little tough to use on scene, um, probably something you have to look at beforehand. So it makes it a little unrealistic, but it's there. If you're looking for some good training, um, UL, plenty of fire stuff, which is very good and I recommend. And, you know, training officers, if you're looking for something for your guys to do, um, you know, away from uh, some of the other online stuff, you know, look through these. These are great. They're an hour to an hour and a half, most of them. There's a quiz at the end, uh, so you can't just sit through it. Uh, there is a quiz at the end, and then you get a certificate. So you could give guys drill credit if they do this on their own time. Um, but there's some very good ones up here. But what I'm looking for, so I haven't done this one, but there's a you know PV system there, um, flammable refrigerants. Let me get to uh, there. You go lithium ion battery ESS. So this is the one. This is where I got a lot of the good information that I just went through on ESS, and there's a lot more in, the, in my presentation on it. And then there's one on lithium ion batteries specifically uh, right here. So science of fire and explosion hazards from lithium ion batteries. So these are good, uh, you know, if you want guys to do some online training and get credit for it, it's a great way to go. And then Tesla has some great resources as well. And they're willing to do virtual training for you as well. I know Beacon Falls is doing it uh, right now. So they'll they'll come on Zoom. I don't think they use Zoom, but I think these Microsoft Teams, they'll come on there and do a training for your department. You can set everyone at home or, or at the firehouse in front of a big screen, and there you go. But these are their emergency response guides. And it's fairly, the Tesla ones are fairly straight to the point and very good. So the information is out there. Um, you just have to be able to find it. And I realized that that can definitely be, you know, a pain in the ass sometimes. So I'm gonna go down to that. I'm gonna put these links into the chat. Um, and then I will look at the text I have. If you have any last questions, get them out there because I'm going to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. So that's the CT fire one. Here's the NFPA, here's the UL. And I really do the UL, um, you know, I certainly recommend the fire, some of the fire ones too. I think they're very good uh, and, and they're pretty quick to the point. You know, there's not a lot of fluff there. And the Tesla. So those are the four guides that um, there's very good information there uh, if you're looking for some stuff to do. So last question, small lithium ion battery phone laptop found to be expanded, not necessarily hot, popping the phone laptop, et cetera, apart. Electronics may or may not still work, same procedure. All right, well, let's try some uh, grammar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I think what you're asking is if it's not hot, but it's expanded. So if it's expanded, uh, something happened to it. Um, I mean, at a minimum, I would get it outside. If you think that the electronic is possibly still usable, then maybe you don't fill it with water, but you're just, you're taking a risk. I mean, at some point, if, if they called the fire department, there's a reason they called the fire department. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think I would take the chance of just putting it in a bucket, but at a minimum, get it outside because if it does go into thermal runaway, we don't want it, um, you know, doing something bad inside the structure. So, you know, again, that's, that, that's a good conversation. It's a good question to talk about beforehand. You know, um, I saw a post the other day, a kid got mad at school and uh, broke his phone in half. Uh, you know, then they had, they, uh, fire department was called the overpack. And I, I don't, I just think we're going to get to the point where there's not a lot of hazmat teams that are going to be willing to come out for a single battery like that. Um, but at the same time, 
we can't leave that inside of the structure. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, but if not, obviously you texted me. Uh, all right, so we had a, he's, uh, he's just, uh, um, we had a call where the homeowner called that she went to go pick up her phone and she found it to be popped apart. The battery pouch almost clearly expanded inside. It still actually was turned on and was cool to the touch. So again, that something happened. I'm not taking the chance. I'm overpacking that properly. Uh, and I wouldn't, I know she probably would want to like get her contacts off of it. But uh, again, there's no, there's no way for me to tell what that battery is going to do. I'm not that smart and I'm not aware of any way that we have of knowing. So I can't say, Hey, hold this. You got two minutes until it explodes in your hand. Right. It would be bad, pretty bad fire department PR if we let her, you know, send a couple emails on it and it went into thermal runaway in her hands. So I'm sorry, if you called 911, I'm playing it safer than sorry. Um, I know we had one where someone called and they said they thought their phone was getting too hot and there was no evidence that there was anything bad going on with it, but we called hazmat and overpacked it because why, what, what chance am I going to take? That's at eight o'clock at night. What chance am I going to take that at 2 a.m.? that phone goes into thermal runaway and sets her apartment on fire. I'm not. So if you call 911 for something like that, um, I'm not taking the chance. I'm overpacking it. So that's me personally. Uh, so that's it. I don't have any more questions in the chats. Um, I've answered the questions I have via text. Uh, so if there's nothing else, guys, uh, thank you for joining me this evening. Um, if anyone asked, this is recorded. It will be on YouTube. Hope you got something out of it. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next one. So thank you all and uh, have a great night.